From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday, our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. I remember this one time early in my career asking my boss for a raise. It was Andy Serwer. He was the editor-in-chief of Fortune magazine. I was so nervous, so nervous I could feel the tears stinging at the corners of my eyes. Maybe this has happened to you. I'd written out exactly what I wanted to say on a little piece of paper that I unfolded from my pocket, and I had barely launched into it before he agreed to the raise. He said, sure. And I was like, wait, but I have the script. Just let me read my script. And then afterwards, I was kicking myself. I mean, if it was that easy for him to grant me my request, I just had to wonder, why hadn't I stopped to ask for more? Well, today's guest is Kwame Christian, and he's a master at difficult conversations like this. Kwame believes you can negotiate just about anything. Kwame's a law professor and a business lawyer, and he's director of the American Negotiation Institute. A couple of years ago, he published a book that spells out his approach. It's got a great title. It's called, Nobody Will Play With Me, How to Use Compassionate Curiosity to Find Confidence in Conflict. Today, we're gonna dig into his philosophy. Here's Kwame. I was always struggling with confidence growing up, and I was a people pleaser, a recovering people pleaser. Here's the thing, you can be a people person in that you understand people, you can communicate well with people, but it doesn't mean that you're good at advocating for yourself. It doesn't mean that you're willing to stand up for yourself and, and really set some clear boundaries and advocate for what you want and need out of life. And so for me, growing up in an all-white community as a Caribbean-American, small town Ohio, I was incredibly different from everybody. And so the first chapter of my book, Finding Confidence in Conflict, shares a story of me on a playground in first grade where I would go around to different groups of kids and ask them to play and nobody would play with me. And the whole recess went that way. And I just went back into the classroom just bawling, just bawling my eyes out. And the teacher said, what happened? I said, nobody would play with me. That very day, I made a vow that this would never happen again. I'll never feel this alone again. And so I went on a, a friendship offensive. <laughs> so I said, everybody's going to be my friend. I'm going to be popular. And it worked. I was. But the problem is I was uh, a people pleaser because I recognized that I worked so hard to get these friendships that I didn't want to do anything to jeopardize it. And so that's what held, held me back when it came to actually advocating for myself. And so I recognized when I was an adult, I needed to make a pivot if I wanted to live the life that I wanted to live. Yeah, you learn first about yourself through trial and error, right? You figure out what works to get people to be on your side, so to speak, or to like you. But then that next piece, once you figured out how to get people to be on your side, that feels a little bit more complicated and like it involves a good deal of self-awareness. And that is figuring out who you are and what you need and how to advocate for yourself. Is that really what you see negotiation as being? Yeah, that's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. And again, recognizing skills versus talent, going back to that point, we can be self-aware and recognize, hey, I have this problem. I'm struggling with this. That's fair. That's good to recognize that. But again, if you don't have that growth mindset, if you say, I just don't have it, then you just accept, okay, this is who I am and my life is going to be terrible, <laughs> right? We have to recognize, no, this is something that we can actually improve upon, but we need to do it in a way that's authentic. So you don't need to change who you are on a fundamental level. You need to acknowledge who you are, acknowledge some of the, the um, barriers that you need to overcome but still be authentic when it comes to communicating. But you need to stand up for yourself. Well, so you have a, a framework that mm -hmm. I would love for you to talk us through. That's a great place to start when we're talking about negotiation. Yeah, so this is called the Compassionate Curiosity Framework, and it's three steps, and you can use it at work and at home. So the first step is acknowledging and validating emotions. The second step is getting curious with compassion. And the third step is joint problem solving. So when I'm uh, negotiating with my five-year-old <laughs> or, or my wife at home, I'm using this exact same framework. When I'm negotiating with opposing counsel as an attorney, I'm using this framework. When I'm teaching people in my negotiation and conflict resolution trainings how to 
to negotiate multi-million dollar deals. This is the same framework. It's all the same. And it has to deal with uh, addressing the emotional barrier first, gathering information, but doing it with a, a tone that is not threatening, and then working collaboratively with the other side to solve the problem. Well, so what is the biggest mistake that people make when they go into a negotiation? The biggest mistake is that they don't address the emotional side. That's the biggest mistake. There's a big difference between being right and being persuasive. You can come in there locked and loaded with all the facts, all of the logic, all of the reasoning and rationale, and still not get what you want. And at the end of the day, it's all about changing hearts and minds. We need to be able to move people. And when you think about the psychology of decision making, people will make decisions first with their emotions. It's unfortunate, but, but it's true. People will usually come to their conclusions first emotionally. And so we have to address those emotional challenges. And then once we've gotten them to a point where they're a little bit more stable, now we can have a higher level conversation. But a lot of times what happens is we try to persuade too soon. We don't take the time to empathize. We don't take the time to work through those emotional challenges. And then we struggle. Well, so the empathy piece is actually something that we, we talk a lot about on Hello Monday. In good communication and how to be a good listener, how effective that can make other things in your life. One thing I was struck by when I was reviewing your strategy was how focused you were on investing the time up front at doing that. Let's say you want to convince your boss that you should be put up for a promotion. You go into that conversation. I got to tell you that I've already been in my professional life for a couple of decades. I would be extremely nervous. I'd have my own sort of emotional metabolism to deal with. And I'd probably jump in there and try to get right to the point. And after reading your material, I realized that's probably not the best way to approach it. Exactly. So first, let's let's take a, a new look at the, the framework. It's used f not only for your external negotiations, but also for your internal negotiations. It's going to be the exact same framework internally directed. So like you said, Jesse, first, we have to address the nervousness. So we need to resolve our own emotional challenges before we get into the conversation. So again, step one, acknowledge and validate our own emotions. How do I feel? I feel nervous. That's okay, right? <laughs> I feel nervous. And so then get curious with compassion. Why do I feel this way? Well, I feel this way because I have a family at home. I, I feel like I deserve this. And this is really, really important to me. That's fantastic. Good. So let's dig deeper and figure out where this emotion is coming from. Now we understand that. And then with joint problem solving internally, what we're doing is we're reconciling the differences between our hearts and our minds. So one way to deal with nervousness in this situation is to completely avoid the conversation. Okay, that satisfies our emotional need, <laughs> but does that help us um, substantively? No, so that's not the right answer. But so what we need to do is figure out what that solution is going to be so we have a lot more clarity during the conversation, right? So let's say we've gone through this process, now we have the conversation. And so, Jesse, let's see, say you're my boss. And so what I'll do is I'll try to assess how you're seeing the situation, right? This is the empathy. So, Jesse, I wanted to take this opportunity to, to get an idea of what where you see my future at this company. How do you see that going? Sit down, listen. Okay, so now we're going to acknowledge and validate what we're seeing. So it sounds like you're saying this. It seems like you're saying this. All right. And so I've been here for a few years. I'm hoping that I can make some advances. And what I was hoping is that I could get a 15% raise and a title change. So we're just going to state that and then say, I want to get your perspective on that. Again, getting curious with compassion. And so we keep on going through this cycle. And if we see hesitation, then we're going to use it sounds like it seems like. Again, acknowledging that emotion. It sounds like there's a little bit of hesitation when it comes to making this decision. Is that right? Okay. Can you tell me what your biggest concerns are? Empathizing. Because again, that's one of those opportunities where we jump into persuasion too soon. We try to counter what the person just thought. No, it's usually an emotional barrier. Let's address that emotional side before we get to the substance. Well, that curiosity piece is so instructive there. Y you essentially took the pressure off the question being about me and my boss, and you moved it to my performance and their expectations of my performance very deftly. And it allowed us to be in the conversation. And you also moved right to your own curiosity about what they think rather than advancing what you think. And the other thing you snuck in there was a way to talk about money without having to put a dollar figure on it. And I want to stop there a second because, and I think this is particularly true for women and for people of color, 
it can really be hard to summon the guts to attach a number to what you want and say it out loud, even to yourself in the mirror, let alone to the person who's going to be doing the deciding. I wonder if you can just talk to that a second. The thing is, you will protect what you value, right? And so before we even get into these negotiations, we have to assess the level of value that we put on ourselves. What is it that we value? Do I value myself? Do I value my career? And sometimes the thing is, we're a little bit insecure. Do I deserve this? Or we're just happy to be there. I see that with a lot of minorities too. It's like, listen, I'm doing better than anybody else in my family. I'm, I'm just happy to be here. This is good enough. I'm not going to be ungrateful for my position. And so what I've suggested people do is that they look at themselves almost like their own attorney. So let's think, if I were representing myself, how would I handle this conversation? Or to make it even easier for you, think about somebody that you love. So for instance, my my wife, right? My, my son. Okay, I'm a little bit uh, afraid or hesitant to go into this conversation, but what if it was Whitney? If Whitney were here in this position and she wasn't being compensated fairly, what would you say on her behalf? Okay, now we're getting to understand what the tone should be. Now we're getting to understand how we should articulate that. Because when we put something that we value in that place, then it helps us to articulate what we want a lot more clearly. That's a beautiful way of thinking of it. Is negotiating anything synonymous with winning any negotiation? It's all about winning, but we have to t see what winning means. So we can win substantively. I can have this conversation and I can get what I want. That's nice. That's a clear win. But what if I do everything the right way, but I don't get what I want? Because here's the thing. I mean, I can do as much as I, I, I want. I could handle everything perfectly. The person could still say no. You have a two-year-old, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> they, We're really good at no in our house. <laughs> exactly, right? No matter how you approach it, that could be the response. That's legitimate. And so here's the thing. There are two goals. Every time in every single negotiation, our goal is to put ourselves in the best position for success. So we're going to utilize the compassionate curiosity framework. We're going to treat people with respect. We're going to empathize. And most importantly, we're going to ask a lot of great open-ended questions. We're going to do that in order to put ourselves in the best position for success because that's the best thing we can do. The second goal is to always improve. Every single time we have an opportunity to have these conversations, it's an opportunity to improve. I think this morning, this morning, I had a conversation in the gym because I, I want to keep my bubble <laughs> while I'm at the gym. And it's scary. I see germs everywhere. And there was a guy there who wasn't wearing a mask. And so remember, I'm still a recovering people pleaser. That doesn't go away. That's still inside me. And so... I had to politely ask him, hey, would you mind wearing a mask when you're around me? He's like, oh, yeah, no problem. And he did it. But Jesse, being honest with you, remember, I have these conversations all the time. I train this. I'm a professor all the time, right? It was. It took me about 15 minutes to work up the courage to have that conversation with him. Oh, but can then we I, talk about that a second? Yes. Because even as you were bringing that up, I was seizing with nerves inside my chest because mm -hmm. that happens to be one that I think a lot of a lot of listeners are confronted with all the time right now. Yeah. Go up to a stranger and ask them to take a move to protect your own health. And it's also become weirdly politicized. It feels almost not personal anymore. And so let me, I'm not proud of this, but let me tell you what I sometimes do in those situations. Yeah. I think about it, review it, text my wife about it, decide I don't need to be on the treadmill anyways, go to the other side of the gym, and then judge the person silently the entire time I'm there and go home and complain about them. Mm-hmm. Yep. Where do you summon the courage to have the conversation? What happens if the answer is no? So here's the two things. So first, having the conversation. That's where most people fail. They don't negotiate for themselves. That's how most people fail in these conversations. So we have to take that step. I want to look at this as a practice opportunity. Every time I do this, I get stronger. I'm still practicing every day, even as a professional in this. That's the first thing. The second thing is perspective is going to play a big role in this. And so I take a deathbed perspective. I say, if I look back on this moment when I am 80, 90, 100, whatever, when I'm passing away, how would I feel about how I performed in this situation? Will I respect the decision that I made? And so what I want to do as much as possible is shift my perspective from a fear of failure to a fear of regret. Will I be able to look back 
on myself in this moment and respect the decision that I made? Or will I regret not having the conversation. And when I think about it this way, it makes it clearer that the the true failure would be not standing up for myself in this moment. It would be not advocating for myself. And so I, it doesn't make it too much easier, but it makes the decision a lot clearer. And so it's like jumping into a cold pool. You just have to take that dive and, and handle it. And what usually happens when I have those conversations, it's usually not as bad as I think it is. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Kwame talks about the difference between asking and giving an ultimatum. And we're back. My guest today is expert negotiator Kwame Christian. Kwame's really smart about positioning requests so they don't feel like attacks. Really, in the majority of these situations, it comes down to their perceptions of liberty and freedom, whether or not they have the rights and the autonomy to live their life the way that you, they want to. And so in those situations where I don't have any leverage over them, what I do is I say, listen, you have a choice, right? If you want to say no, you can say no. But it would be really helpful for me because, and this is one of those magic words in persuasion, because, because my wife is pregnant, she's asked me to be very careful about who I'm around and how I'm around them. Would you mind wearing a mask? Oh, yeah, no problem. Made it a lot easier. Yeah. And I wonder what we can learn from rejection that makes us better at negotiating. Oh, this is great. So two things. First thing is rejection therapy. Um, so when you think about cognitive behavioral therapy, they have exposure therapy. You need to expose yourself to the thing that scares you the most. And a lot of people, like you said, are afraid of rejection. And it makes sense. Think about why it's so important to, to fear rejection, why that's such an important motivating factor for humanity. Because if you think about it through a lens of evolutionary psychology, you go back in the past when we're in our tribes, if I'm rejected from my social circle, that's death, right? Because I need my people. And so we all have this sense that we're very sensitive to the fear of rejection. It hurts. And it hurts to the point where studies have demonstrated that if you give somebody an analgesic, it actually reduces the pain that is experienced through rejection. How crazy is that? It's processed like an actual physical pain. And so it's very logical and reasonable that people have that fear of rejection. Now, what we can do is intentionally expose ourselves to rejection in order to overcome it. And so this is what I do. I say, okay, if I'm afraid, that is a trigger that I need to do this. And so what I started doing is asking for things that I didn't think that I would ever get. An example, going to a coffee shop and I had a, a kid I was mentoring with me. And so it was my birthday and they said, oh, Mr. Christian, it's your birthday, here's a free pastry. I said, thank you. Well, I'm here with my mentee, can he get a free pastry too? She said, um, I, I'd probably have to ask my manager. I said, well, can you please ask your manager? I should not get this thing, Jesse, but I asked for it in order to get rejected so I can get over this. I'm doing this strategically. But what what's really funny is that when you start doing this, <laughs> you start getting a lot more yeses than you thought. And of course, you got this free pastry. So I think that's something we need to consider. We need to work on overcoming that fear of rejection by intentionally exposing ourselves to rejection by asking for what we want. I love that. I think so often we just reject ourselves before we ever give anybody the opportunity to reject us, right? Exactly. Right. And by a falling victim to that fear and letting that fear make the decision for us, we are guaranteeing the outcome that we feared the most. So we fear rejection. We fear failure. So we choose to fail on our own terms. Mm -hmm. There's got to be an important lesson in writing the story the way that you want it to go before you enter into the conversation so that you're not seeing it the way that you fear it but seeing it the way that you're excited to experience it. So I want to talk a little bit about the emotions that you have as the person who is entering into the negotiation, because I, I find that one thing that I'm still not great at is in the moment, if I'm nervous or if I'm afraid, getting into that conversation and doing something like crying. And you want to derail a conversation like that real quick. That's how. It makes everybody in the room nuts. So what thoughts might you have on that front? Yeah. So I've, I've worked with a, a few people who have uh, crying as one of their, not, not a, a response to sadness, but usually it's a response to anger. Um, and what I tell them is this, listen, I've, I haven't worked with anybody who's really been able to say, all right, yeah, I did this thing. And then I stopped crying. 
I think that's just their response. And so what I tell people is you have to kind of almost lean into that and tell somebody beforehand what they could expect. Just say, listen, this is something I care about a lot. And sometimes when I care about something a lot, I cry. And I want you to know that you shouldn't freak out about that, <laughs> okay? It's not a sign that I'm breaking down. It is just a sign that I care. And so what we're doing, we're using the psychological principle of priming. And so what we're telling them is like, this is what you're going to see. And when you see this, this is what I want you to think. Because otherwise, we're allowing them to control the narrative. Oh, this is weakness, right? That's what I'm seeing in you. No, 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 my friend. I'm going to tell you what this means before you come up with your own story that's less favorable to me. I love that. I love that. In fact, I'm going to put it into practice immediately. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Because um, you're right. Ultimately, if I care about something, and you're right, it's not when I'm sad. It's when I care so deeply about something, regardless of the person's reaction to what I have to say, that emotion is engendered. And it's not always crying for people. I think there are a lot of different ways in which emotion impedes our ability to be good communicators. Absolutely. Well, well, think about this too. There's um, there's a book by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. Fantastic book. He was a, a Jew in Auschwitz, but he was also a, a psychologist. And he was the, the person who came up with logotherapy, reverse intentionality. And so here's an example. So I remember one time, uh, one of my friends, she was walking through uh, a parking lot and uh, a man made an advance aggressively. And so she was able to avoid the situation, but she came to the office and she was trembling, just could not stop shaking. Her hands could not stop shaking. It was about 10 to 15 minutes. She's like, I'm, I feel more composed, but I, my hands just cannot stop shaking. And so what I said was this, I want you to try to make your hands shake more. They're shaking this much. I want you to try to make them shake more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And what happened was they started to shake less. And so when you think about crying, what often happens is that you try to hold it back. You try to create these things saying, no, I'm not going to feel this. I'm not going to feel this. And by trying not to feel it, you feel it more. And so you kind of just have to lean into it. Just accept it. Because for me, like I, I do public speaking all the time all the time. And what's funny is that I used to have a terrible fear of public speaking. I would shake. I, my voice would quiver. It was horrible and incredibly embarrassing. The thing is, I still feel that way, but I changed the way I think about it. It's a joke to me at this point because I say, okay, instead of saying I'm feeling this physical um, expression because I'm nervous, I say I'm feeling this because I'm excited. And it's great to be excited. I should be excited here. And so if you're somebody who cries, it's like, oh, I really care about this. And I should care about this. This is important. And you'll probably find yourself crying a little bit less the more you lean into it and accept that's who you are. That's a wonderful way to think about it. I want to step back to that perspective suggestion that you made, this idea that going into any difficult conversation, think about what it's going to feel like when you're 100 years old, what the outcome will mean to you then. That makes me realize that some conversations are more difficult than others. Probably not going to remember the man at the gym in the mask. I probably won't even remember my manager conversation, maybe. I'll probably remember most of the conversations that I've had with my wife, hope. Why is it that those conversations, the ones that are not at work, but in our personal life are so much harder? I talk about this all the time <laughs> because I tell people as good as I am in the workplace, that's how bad I am at home. <laughs> I really. And, and so again, remember what I said earlier about thinking about yourself as a lawyer, um, your own attorney. Um, I started recognizing I had to take that business persona that I had at work and bring it to home. And most people would say, ooh, you're going to be a cold lawyer. Jesse, do I sound like a cold lawyer to you? I'm very empathetic, right? And so I just need to take that level of professionalism to my conversations at home because the reason why the form breaks down at home is because those conversations matter more. Yeah. The stakes are higher. I can quit my job. I can go to a different gym. 
but I can't just quit my wife that easily, right? And so the the stakes are so much higher at home. That's why it's going to have such a, uh, such a higher emotional toll on us. And I think we have to recognize that because I think a lot of times we don't approach these conversations at home with the respect that they deserve. And because of that, we're not on our game. And then we make simple mistakes that we probably wouldn't make at work. Yeah, and when you say that, what really sort of hits home for me is that I don't bring the empathy to those conversations at home the way I might to somebody that I don't know as well, who I'm curious about trying to understand. I'm, again, I'm not proud of this, but I feel like I'm probably day to day less curious about my wife because you know what? I've lived with her for nine and a half years. Mm -hmm. When in fact, if I brought back that curiosity about her emotions, where they were coming from, where she was starting from, I don't know, most of this would probably go a lot better. And Absolutely. we have a good marriage, mind you. Yep, yep. Same here. It's funny. We're we're like the, the same person, right? <laughs> because we have a young child a young child and another one on the way, right? So this is and I my I've been married for ten years. And so here's the thing too. I feel as though I know you. You know me. You should not only know me, but know my intentions, know my heart. You should just get this. I should say it one time and you should get it, right? How how do you not get it? And then we get more upset, right? But think about this. Day to day, we're finding out new things about ourselves. We've known ourselves for even longer and we're still finding out new things about ourselves. So think about the level of arrogance that we have when it comes to interactions with our, our significant others, our family and friends, when we say, I already know what they think. They should already know me. This conversation should be easy. And it's not easy. It's because they are being difficult, right? And so, again, if we bring that level of curiosity and just say, you know what? I don't know. I don't fully understand where they're coming from. I need to use the compassionate curiosity framework and maintain my form in this conversation. Things go a lot better. And I can tell a very clear difference when I do that and when I don't. Yeah, well said. Um, well, listen, thank you for spending time with us today. Absolutely. That was Kwame Christian, director of the American Negotiation Network and host of the podcast, Negotiate Anything. Check it out. Making this episode gave our team such great tools for handling tough conversations. And we want to know your tips, too. So come chat on Office Hours this week about negotiating with producer Sarah Storm and me. We'll convene, as usual, Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern. To find us, follow me on LinkedIn at Jesse Hempel or email us at hellomonday at linkedin.com. And thanks to everyone who's reviewed us. The reviews, they help so much. So once a month, I like to ask Sarah to share one. If it's yours, email us at hellomonday at linkedin.com, and I'll jump on the phone with you to help you make sure you're getting the most from LinkedIn. These conversations have been so fun. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Jesse. So who have we got today? Today, we have Cubs hashtag, 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 or maybe that's pound, pound, pound. You'll have to let us know. Who writes, where was this podcast when I first entered the workforce? Thankfully, every episode still turns out to be preventative or curative. So far, so good for us all. Thanks, Cubs, for supporting the show. And if you're listening, please email us at hellomonday at LinkedIn.com. And if you like the show, please take a minute now to weigh in on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Sarah Storm. Joe DiGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Riando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Michaela Greer and Victoria Taylor bring compassionate curiosity to Hello Monday. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. You also heard music from Poddington Bear. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. See you next Monday. Thanks for listening. My favorite way to drink coffee is to not drink coffee. I'm a tea guy. I like jasmine tea. Yeah, and, and Earl Grey. I'm a classic kind of tea drinker. <laughs>